Shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. We've all heard it before, and in November, Japan finally gave it a shot. When Artemis 1 was launched in November 16, it took 10 CubeSats with it. JAXA's Omotenosh was the only one to actually try to land on the moon, and if it worked, they'd be the fourth country to ever soft land on the moon, all while having the lightest moon lander by a mile, with the Surface Pro weighing just 700 grams. As you may have been able to tell, it didn't work. So let's go over what it should have done, what went wrong, and what's next for this tiniest of probes. After being released from SLS, it would have oriented itself using a set of reaction wheels, so its panels are pointing directly to the sun and measure radiation while it's coasting to the moon. Then, after a day or so, it would have put itself in a collision course using its attitude control thrusters. They would then deploy a small airbag, and after a little bit, the solid rocket motor inside would light up and detach from the rest of the spacecraft together with the surface probe for a nice 180 km per hour litter braking maneuver, which is very fast in Freedom Units, breaking its fall with the airbag. Older designs feature two airbags, or some sort of crushable material like styrofoam. When on the ground, a transmitter would turn on that anyone with an amateur ham radio would be able to tune into. Unfortunately, even NASA's Deep Space Network couldn't get a hold of it. After it was deployed, it quickly started tumbling out of control with the solar panels pointing directly away from the sun. They were unable to get it under control, and the electricity quickly ran out. They kept trying to contact it, but they never managed to get it to phone home, and they inevitably missed the moon. So what happened? Engineers at JAXA quickly figured out the attitude control thrusters were the most likely culprit. The fuel for these thrusters is stored as a liquid in a tank. When needed, a valve is opened and a heater is activated to put a small amount of gaseous fuel in a small tank, called the plenum. Each attitude control thruster unit has four valves for four different thrusters. As it turns out, the fuel tank leaked a small amount of liquid fuel into the plenum over the three years of Modern Ash have fueled up in a cupboard doing nothing. They originally fueled it up in 2019, thinking it wouldn't be too long until it would launch, but due to optimistic planning and Rona, it took much longer. The liquid fuel in the plenum caused the pressure to be much higher than it should have been, and so the thrusters were far more powerful. Now this shouldn't have been a problem. When the probe is spinning too fast, it turns on its attitude control thrusters for rate damping mode and realistically speaking, the liquid fuel in the plenum would be used up eventually. But when the ray damping mode turned on, one of the valves for one of the thrusters got stuck on, and over the course of 5 minutes it started spinning faster and faster, up to 80 degrees per second. So now they missed their target, but the mission is not over yet. In this animation you can see the trajectory of a mother ash in purple relative to the Earth and the Moon. In the bottom left corner you can see the angle of the Sun relative to where the solar panels are pointing. As the Earth revolves around the Sun, the angle by which Omotan Ash is lit changes. By mid-January, the solar panels would be illuminated once more, and by the end of March, they should be producing enough electricity for the spacecraft to turn itself back on. NASA's Deep Space Network will be listening for it, though it will be very, very faint. Engineers actually reckon they can re-establish contact, stop the rotation, get control back, and test most of the equipment on board. Getting data about radiation well outside the Earth's magnetosphere can be very valuable for understanding how to protect satellites and future astronauts. They also intend to fire the solid rocket motor, though hitting the moon is no longer in the cards. This way, one of the primary objectives can still be achieved, to test technologies that may be used in CubeSat missions to the moon and beyond. Using much smaller satellites like CubeSats can bring the cost per mission way down, allowing for more missions or allowing smaller organizations to fund their own without needing to rely on space agencies. Omotanash, for example, costs only 6 million US dollars to design and build, which is a lot cheaper than, for example, the Slim Lunar Lander, which costs 135 million. It may also be launched on smaller rockets, which is a lot cheaper. I did the maths, and Omotanash could have been launched in a small set launcher like Interstellar Technologies Zero, Space Wants' Kairos or Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket, with room to spare for a total of less than $20 million. Motonash may not have landed on the moon, but Japan will have two more shots to become the fourth nation to land on the moon before the summer. iSpace's Hakuto R lander is currently in orbit around the moon and will be landing at the end of April. JAXA's Slim Lunar Lander will be launched on the next H2A rocket together with the CRISM X-ray Telescope. 
The recent failure of the H3 test flight made Lay's launch a little bit, but you can expect it anywhere between April and June. But no matter what happens, I'm hyped. If you like this video, please share it with a friend, and if you wish to see more like it, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.